Hey, welcome everyone to the Asset Leadership Network 2021 National Issues. And today I'm very happy to have the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, executives report on the 2021 Infrastructure Report Card. We have Anna Denicky, Director of Infrastructure, Caroline Sevier, Director of Government Relations, and David Totman, who is the ASCE representative as the voting member to the US Technical Advisory Group to ISO 55000. And we frequently say we're very happy to have this group of people talking. So I wanted to do something more than say we're very happy. And I have put on a tie for the first time in one year to indicate how important I think this uh, event is. In 2017, we had an event at the National Academy of Sciences and the um, American Society of Civil Engineers presented on that uh, uh, year's report card. And um, the pandemic prevented us from being able to do this in person and we would have been at the National Academies again, but uh, we're very happy to have this information shared with uh, our, our, our group of uh, asset leaders. So, Anna's gonna start off and give an overview of uh, the report card. Caroline will say how the report card is being used to help influence legislation. And then David Totman is going to talk about how the uh, ISO 55000 can enhance all of the activities to improve our infrastructure. So Anna, would you like to give yourself a little introduction and uh, start your report? Sure. Hello, everyone. Anna Denicky, Director of Infrastructure Initiatives, as was mentioned at ASCE. Um, while I am talking, I'm going to try to go ahead and share my screen. I think it's Nick who's sharing his. No, nope, I am sharing mine. I've got to stop. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. Oh, Anna, while you're setting yours up, mm -hmm. I forgot to thank the Andrew James Advisory Group who is one of our organizational members who is sponsoring the production of our post uh, video and podcast. So thank you very much to the Andrew James Advisory Group. Great. Uh, so we have been hard at work putting together the 2021 infrastructure report card. Some of you may have seen it uh, came out on March 3rd of this month. Um, so that is the culmination of about 18 months of work on behalf of the society um, to put together a report card with 17 infrastructure categories. So I will go through the results briefly. I will talk about some of the highlights um, and lowlights of the report card. And then as was mentioned, I'll turn it over to Caroline Sevier to talk about the advocacy efforts that we center around the report card. It is always our goal that this document does not sit on a shelf collecting dust, but instead is utilized, cited, looked at every day by elected officials, uh, members of the public and decision makers in Washington and around the country. So first, a little bit about the report card methodology. We have what we call our eight key criteria. Uh, which is what you see in front of you. We use these eight key criteria for every chapter of the report card. So bridges, wastewater, stormwater, hazardous waste, those are all graded according to eight key criteria. They are, as you see, capacity, condition, funding, future need, O&M, public safety, resilience, and innovation. This is our methodology. This is what we use, as I mentioned, in all categories of the report card nationally, as well as with our state report cards. Before I go into the grades themselves, let me talk a little bit about our grading key. Um, most of our infrastructure categories are in the D or C range. D means our systems are poor and at risk. C means that in general, they're in mediocre condition and they require attention. Uh, it's, we actually advocate to a grade of a B. So we think that ensuring our infrastructure systems are in good condition and adequate for now is the best use of public funds. There are a lot of competing resources for very limited dollars. Um, so we just want to ensure our infrastructure is in good working condition 
it can support the population using it. It can support the businesses relying on it. Uh, F is failing or critical. We don't assign very many Fs. Really, the only F in recent memory and recent history is um, the Puerto Rico energy system. So it really would have to be a full-on system failure in order for us to give an F grade. So without further ado, the 2021 infrastructure report card grades are in front of you. For the first time since we began putting together the report card over 20 years ago, our infrastructure is out of the D range. On average, our infrastructure earns a grade of a C minus. So again, it's in mediocre condition, uh, kind of barely out of that poor classification. Obviously nothing to write home to your parents about, uh, not a grade that we should be proud of. However, we did see some notable improvements. Um, so what you see in front of you, we had five categories where the grades went up. Um, and in the categories where the grades did go up, oftentimes that was a result of federal investment. So through appropriations measures, through um, supplemental appropriations, or through long-term reauthorizations, as well as some additional grant funding, we did see some federal investments flow to areas like ports and inland waterways. Um, in drinking water, we saw actually Flint serve as a little bit of a catalyst to increase available federal funding and financing for, uh, for drinking water infrastructure. Similarly, we saw utilities um, employ asset management at greater rates and start to really take stock of not only what they had, but where it was most effective to direct limited resources to. Uh, energy, we also saw the grade go from a D plus to a C minus. We are seeing a growing recognition of the importance of resilience proofing the infrastructure. However, there is a lot of progress still to be made in that area. Um, our one category grade that did go down was bridges. Bridges went from a C plus to a C. For the first time, we saw the number of fair bridges surpass the number of good bridges. Um, for a long time, and sort of, a, I draw parallels to the Flint story. Um, after the bridge fell down in Minneapolis, there was a sort of a, a nationwide reckoning and a reprogramming of funding to start going to bridges to bring them back to a state of good repair. That progress has slowed over recent, uh, especially in the, the past few years and recent history. And we are now starting to see the condition of bridges really level off or even decline slightly. So that's an area of concern. Overall, we had 11 categories in the D range. Um, so while our, while our GPA did nudge up a bit, it's very modest progress. It's possible to likely that a lot of that progress uh, will be erased because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impacts to revenue streams. So it's very important that decision makers don't take their foot off the gas and that really um, some transformational big bold funding comes down the pipeline because we've seen what can happen when just a little bit more is available and leveraged by everybody from the localities, municipalities to the private sector. In addition to grading 17 categories of infrastructure, we also put together a uh, investment gap chart. So we actually look at what it would take to bring our infrastructure back to a state of good repair. Um, we are, our, our investment gap over 10 years has grown. It's about 2.58 trillion as of our latest, latest assessment. That as I mentioned, has grown from about 2.1 trillion just four years ago. So as we have been warning for decades, and I know the folks on this call are well aware, when we put off basic maintenance, when we put off, uh, when we have deferred maintenance, the backlog balloons, the problems compound on each other um, and our investment gap grows. So obviously this is not good news. Um, however, let me draw your attention to a couple of notable takeaways from this chart. First of all, the surface transportation gap is roughly the same as it was uh, four years ago. It's grown just a little bit, uh, but that is pretty much holding steady. 
Um, we have seen a number of states raise their gas taxes, and that has sort of helped maintain the steady state. Of course, it's it's essentially um, kept us even with inflation. So in terms of really making meaningful uh, progress on the backlog of maintenance, that has not happened. In water and wastewater and stormwater, that gap has grown quite a bit. Um, that's actually our, our, our largest area of growth. Um, when we look at this report versus four years ago, that's for a number of reasons. First of all, the infrastructure is aging. Um, we also added stormwater as a category. And then third, which I think is really of interest and relevance to this group, as I mentioned, asset management is being employed at much greater rates in utilities, but that is uncovering the scope of the problem. Um, when folks get in there and see where the infrastructure is, what kind of condition it's in, when it was built or installed, um, it's really highlighting the pressing needs for uh, revitalization of these systems. I'll mention a good, a good news story here. Um, our parks and recreation number dropped uh, by about a third. And that is because we have uh, the Congress passed the Great American Outdoors Act, which will meaningfully provide some meaningful funding for parks infrastructure, National Park Service infrastructure. Um, a lot of people don't realize parks are basically like mini cities, right? They have roads and bridges and drinking water systems, um, and those all need to be maintained. So the backlog was growing uh, at a pretty concerning rate. However, Congress took a big step past the Great American Outdoors Act, and our gap has gone from about 100 billion to 77 billion over 10 years. So encouraging there, excuse me, our, our total needs number. Um, and then I just wanted to mention one other thing before um, I go into, I turn it over to Caroline to talk more present day legislation and trends. Um, we are, you know, sometimes we go into Capitol Hill offices and, and we talk to lawmakers or decision makers and they say, you know, we know a D plus, we know a C minus isn't great news. And of course, that's that's not a grade we want to take home or, or wave around, but I still get to work on time may take me a little bit longer sitting in traffic or waiting for the metro. What does it really matter that our infrastructure is not up to snuff, um, that it's not in a state of good repair? So we've actually quantified through our economic studies what that means to the American economy and the average household. It costs uh, over 20 years, it's an average of $3,300 a year that we're spending due to infrastructure deficiencies. So again, that is time lost, productivity lost, waiting for the metro. It's unanticipated car repairs. Every time our, you know, we have to do a realignment to our car or replace the tires early, that of course is money lost. Um, it's when our power goes out and the food spoils in the fridge or our electronics get damaged from an from a electric grid surge. So that is real money out the door um, because our infrastructure is, is deficient. $3,300 a year is about the cost of takeout for a family of four a week. Certainly relevant in these COVID times. Uh, you can also start a college fund with that type of money or, or do a home repair. So this is a powerful talking point as we, we talk through not only the grades, but what they mean for all of us. Not only does ASCE assess the infrastructure and put out a cost um, to all levels of government and the private sector to fix it. Um, we also provide recommendations to raise the grades. And those can be grouped into three general buckets, which, which is what you see here, leadership in action, investment, and then a focus on resilience. So well, we're very glad that uh, President Biden has, has co-opted the Build Back Better message. We've been saying that for a really long time. It's not just about replacing the infrastructure that was there before, but doing it in a smarter way, one that takes into account increasingly severe storms, thinks through um, population growth and other 21st century challenges. I also want to pause on leadership and action really quickly and, and just emphasize one of the things that this report card uncovered, if we're talking about macro trends, is the limited availability of data in some categories. 
Um, and I will specifically mention stormwater as well as areas like schools um, and even wastewater and drinking water. There uh, is not a whole lot of aggregated publicly available national data sets for those categories. And so one of the things that we want to see our leaders do is uh, encourage the infrastructure owners to collect data, standardize it, update it, and then utilize it in uh, asset management so that we can be sure we're making the best decisions with limited publicly available funding. As I mentioned, especially in drinking water, we are seeing an uptick in uh, utilization of these tools. However, there are significant challenges. You need political buy-in, hence the leadership. Uh, you also need the, um, the experts on staff for assisting to help create these systems in the first place. So you do see larger metropolitan areas utilize asset management. In some cases, the rural areas are a little bit farther behind and there needs to be a concerted effort or incentivization um, of these strategies to make sure that they are more evenly utilized. Oh, Anna, can I ask a, a question? Sure. Oh, well, or make a statement. First of all, this is really powerful. We could have a number of presentations, just like how you did this. This is an amazing body of work. And thank you for sharing just a slice of it. Um, four years ago, five years ago, we had a work group, a series of work groups and information management came out with the concept that data is an asset. And I wonder if you have a category that is managing the data well that we could use as an example for water and wastewater and the other ones. Sure. I mean, I think the, the best category of data is in bridges. Um, there's the National Bridge Inventory, which is a FHWA database, but it is um, the, the states and localities and bridge owners contribute to it. So. Um, you have everything from the age of the structure, you have information on its latest inspection, you have the results of that inspection. Um, so that sort of aggregated publicly available information is incredibly useful and, and is, um, is would be wonderful to see something like that in drinking water and wastewater. I think, <clears throat> you know, even lower hanging fruit in that area is the clean water needs survey. As you all may know, um, there's there hasn't been a, an update to the EPA Clean Water Needs Survey since 2012. That's not a perfect method, um, but it does sort of capture the needs in terms of, you know, um, it, it sorts the needs by category and by state. And so that can even give us some information on our needs growing, are they being addressed, um, and what kind of needs those might be. So. I believe that Congress's mandate or has mandated EPA to update that study, but they have not provided the funding. Um, so that's really low hanging fruit that would help at least start to get us closer to a more comprehensive look at wastewater infrastructure in this country. Thank you. And is this a good time to ask about Texas and how that helps shine a light? Sure, yes. Um, great question. So the, the question is, how do events like the power outage in Texas impact the scores and funding gaps? There's not so much a lack of funding, it seems, but a business and political decision to isolate their power network. Sure. So um, the Texas situation is a little bit unique. Um, we, when we look at energy, primarily what, what civil engineers deal with is transmission and distribution. The Texas situation uh, was caused by a generation uh, problem and imbalance. So, you know, I would say sort of taking that, that lesson learned and thinking about the country as a whole and the energy chapter as a whole, we looking forward when Biden talks about um, making the energy system more green and more sustainable, what we really emphasize there is in order to, in order to make that happen, you have to invest in transmission lines in particular. You need to actually get the energy from one area to another uh, of the country. If you have you know, uh, wind in the Midwest, well, you need to get that over to West Virginia and that requires transmission lines. So, um, and, and you know, then that leads into a conversation about 
uh, streamlining permitting and sort of providing some very limited federal investment levers where appropriate. So yes, we don't necessarily, we aren't wading into that particular business or political decision, but I think just going forward, it's, it's, a, it's a reminder as well that um, we, we are facing increasingly severe storms. Resilience needs to be front of mind and center in all of our decisions. And um, it's a cautionary tale of, <laughs> of um, what can happen when too many, uh, I, I'll stop there, but <laughs> there are some lessons to be learned in terms of transmission. And it also just shines a light on the issue of resiliency, investment, leadership, and action. So that's appropriate. So um, if you haven't yet, I very much encourage you to reach out uh, to contact, to visit our URL, infrastructurereportcard.org. If you do have additional questions, I'm going to be on the line, and I think I saw one pop in. So I'll give that a look. Um, but I will turn it over to Caroline to talk a little bit about the legislative landscape, and we can continue to take questions throughout the rest of the hour. Caroline? Well, Caroline, uh, before you get started, I, I was remiss in not uh, reminding people to set commit uh, comments and questions into those areas, but uh, I think uh, uh, they're getting the hang of it. And while uh, we're on the topic of reaching out, uh, is your um, spectacular presentation, your original presentation recorded and available online? Yeah, if, if you guys haven't seen it, their original presentation on this is a much must see TV, and it's only a web program. So, thank you. Yes, it is. Um, InfrastructureReportCard.org backslash 2021 release event. We have the whole uh, summit recorded. We break it down by panel, um, and I encourage you to check it out. There's a lot of sound bites. We had Secretary Buttigieg um, talk to close this out, as well as Mayor Ho uh, Governor Hogan and a several senators and representatives. Um, and then I'll just quickly answer the question from Mike. So there's a conscious decision not to include federal buildings such as federal courthouses, military installations, et cetera. Um, what is the reason for that? That is a very easy answer. And the answer is a lack of data. Um, we do not have any aggregated reported information on federal courthouses or anything like that. The military installations, I have not looked into this one as much, but I imagine that information is probably um, confidential and not able to be reported out to the public if it does exist. So it's a reminder, we, yes, we can only grade what we have limited information on. And in that case, there's just not a whole lot out there. All right, Caroline, over to you. Thank you, Anna. So for this next portion of the agenda, I'm going to dive a little bit into what we're currently seeing on Capitol Hill, what we're seeing from the administration and share some of ASE's priorities as we're looking ahead for the 117th Congress. We really saw the start of the Biden administration and the change of control in the Senate um, compounded by Congress, um, really trying to tackle the economic impacts of the COVID-19, bringing us to a unique place where we actually expect to see some sort of comprehensive infrastructure package probably being enacted this year. It's something that's been discussed um, for many years at this point, and it looks like 2021 might actually be the year to get something done. Therefore, the release of our 2021 report card really could not have come at a better time as it is a key resource as we're engaging with legislators about what some of our infrastructure needs are, but even more importantly, what some of those solutions are to raise the grades that Anna had discussed before. So as I mentioned, we're in a unique place in time. Both the administration and Congress are in agreement that they wanna move forward on an infrastructure package. We don't yet know what that's gonna look like, um, but I will say that those of us that actually are closely tracking infrastructure legislation in Washington, DC, probably feel a bit more positive now than we really have in years that something's gonna get done. Um, and I will say work's already underway. Um, President Biden has already held several meetings uh, with leaders in the House and Senate to start what an infrastructure package is, and I can get to more of that in a few minutes. But first, I really wanted to highlight 
some of the priorities that ASCE shared earlier this year with the with Congress and the administration regarding what we want to make sure is included in an infrastructure bill. You can see here on this slide what some of those priorities are. I want to highlight that prioritizing asset management and operations and maintenance needs is one of our top priorities for the year, as is the adoption of performance criteria and uniform national standards as we're going forward. So we hope that that's included in any, uh, any final bill, whether it be an infrastructure bill, surface transportation reauthorization, et cetera. More specifically, we are urging Congress to really look at performance-based ownership of infrastructure, as well as sustainable engineering practices and life cycle cost performance as they're developing a bill. So it's something that we, we have support and we support for, year, for years is the use of asset management strategies as really a great way that we can be utilizing our limited infrastructure funding and try to minimize some of these long-term owning and operating costs of the system. So um, we hope that we see these priorities in any sort of infrastructure legislation going forward, again, whether it be a comprehensive package or a surface transportation reauthorization, this is kind of our starting point of what we wanna see in that uh, legislation. Anna, next slide, please. So now that I've kind of laid some of that groundwork, I wanted to talk through what our la legislative landscape really is looking like. And right now, everything that we've been seeing legislatively is kind of been broken into two buckets. We have legislation that's really has been aimed so far at relief from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're starting to see that, see that shift to the recovery from the pandemic. So all those bills that we've seen over the past year, such as this bill that just got signed into law earlier this month, have really been focused on that relief aspect of, of, of the pandemic and reacting to the pandemic. Um, as I said earlier, um, or as I just said, President Biden did sign earlier this month the American Rescue Plan. That was a $1.9 trillion infusion into the economy. And that did represent the third really significant federal COVID relief bill. Um, that we that we have seen in the past year. Just this past bill, the American Rescue Plan, when we look at the infrastructure sector, it did include $350 billion for states, cities, uh, tribal governments, and localities. And that's money that states and localities could um, opt to utilize uh, potentially in infrastructure needs. However, there's no guarantee that that money will be going to infrastructure. Where we see a little bit more of a guarantee is that the bill did provide another $30 billion for the transit sector. It did include $8 billion for airports, uh, about $1.7 billion for Amtrak, as well as uh, $122 billion for a school infrastructure. And that school infrastructure money is uh, available through September, 2023. What we, uh, while uh, some of our state DOTs could see some of that funding for state and local governments, potentially, again, no guarantee. The last COVID relief bill that was enacted back in December did specifically provide $10 billion to state DOTs. However, that's well below what state DOTs have actually estimated their needs are. Uh, state DOTs have estimated that the pandemic has probably left a revenue gap of about $37 billion. Um, so again, while those were not directly addressed, the American Rescue Plan does have that state funding that could potentially help some of the infrastructure sectors as we're going forward. But uh, what I really wanna highlight the rest of my remarks on is this next phase we're going into, that response phase, um, that response and recovery phase, I should say. And that's where we really see this infrastructure package fitting in. President Biden and congressional leaders have stressed that once the American Rescue Plan passed, that the next big bill out of the gate is gonna be an infrastructure package. As I said, these meetings are already starting to take place. So we're starting to think through now um, what might be getting implemented and how we can start to shift that conversation with our report card as one of those tools as that conversation. So what really is the time frame that we're looking at for an infrastructure package? Again, the president and Congress are kind of shifting right now as we speak, trying to move to a COVID package. We did hear earlier uh, just yesterday that the White House is potentially preparing a $3 trillion package that would not all be geared toward infrastructure, would also be geared to a lot of other domestic priorities, such as universal pre-K. Um, but that package, that $3 trillion, we're hearing rumors, uh, might be broken into potentially two packages, that infrastructure piece 
and then those other domestic policies. Um, so that's something that's still going to be forthcoming. Um, we are hearing that that's something that the White House might be sharing already with congressional leadership as soon as this week. But I think you'll start to really hear something more formal coming from the administration in early April when the president isn't expected to address a joint session of Congress and start to release his, but, uh, his budget request for the year. Um, Anna, we can go to the next slide. But what is Congress thinking through? We're still waiting to get that, that package from the president, but where can we start to see uh, Congress starting out right now? And I think the best, best reference point as we are looking to where Congress might be thinking is looking at HR2, which was the Moving Forward Act, which is a bill that was passed by House Democrats last year. Uh, that bill last year, again, was only passed with House Democratic support. It did not, it was not taken up in the Senate at all as the Senate was under Republican control. And that bill really was seen at the time as a messaging bill in order to show what some of the Democrats' priorities are for infrastructure investment. But now that uh, Democrats have control of the White House as well as both chambers, this is something that we may actually start to see getting implemented and really become legislation. So from what we are hearing, at least in the House, they are looking at HR2 as their starting point for developing any legislation. Um, it might be bigger than HR2, um, but this is probably your best bet of where to start to look at so you can start to see where Democrats are gonna start to break up some of those buckets of money for a comprehensive infrastructure bill. We have actually already seen the House Energy and released two infrastructure bills that might be included in one of these broader packages that start to address some of these sectors that you see here. Those are the Clean Future Act and the LIFT Act. The Clean Future Act is really aimed at reducing um, our carbon emissions to net zero by 2050, um, while the LIFT Act is really starting to make some of those significant investments in our nation's water infrastructure and brownfields restoration and in broadband. Um, but taking together both of those bills, while they have both been introduced only by Democrats, they're an encouraging sign that Congress really is serious about an infrastructure package and an infrastructure package that's not just for traditional roads and bridges, but that's going to be a little bit bigger and start to hit on um, a variety of infrastructure sectors. The only indicator we really have right now for where the Senate is going in terms of numbers, you'd have to reference back to their surface transportation reauthorization. Uh, bill that the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee did pass um, out last Congress almost two years ago now. That was America's Transportation Infrastructure Act, and that was a $287 billion uh, five-year reauthorization of surface transportation programs. From what we are hearing in the Senate, it sounds like uh, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee is hoping to prepare a package that they'd be able to put forward in May. Um, and the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee is working on a similar time frame. Anna, we can go to the next slide. So I want to um, just spend a few moments to kind of dig a little bit deeper into kind of the surface transportation space. Um, and one date I really want to make sure is on all of your radar to keep in mind as we are looking at an infrastructure package this year is September 30th because that's when the current extension of surface transportation programs will once again expire. Last year, um, the FAST Act, which is our current surface transportation bill, did expire on September 30th. We got a one-year extension and that will become due again later this year. So that extension that we saw last year transferred $13.6 billion from the Highway Trust Fund into the general fund in order to keep programs afloat for an extra year. And as we are um, having meetings with members of Congress, what we are really hearing is that they're starting to tee up and uh, develop a surface transportation reauthorization bill, and then potentially separately on a separate track, a comprehensive infrastructure package. And the one reason why these might be separate is that the surface transportation reauthorization bill is going to include a lot of policy work as any reauthorization would. Whereas a broader infrastructure package is something that might get end up getting done under budget reconciliation. And if done under budget reconciliation, a lot, of, a lot of those policy pieces that would need to be done in the surface transportation reauthorization would not be able to be done under budget reconciliation. So that if Democrats do decide to go forward with budget reconciliation for a comprehensive infrastructure package, um, which would make it a bit easier for them to get it through because they wouldn't need um, 
they wouldn't need as much Republican support, um, we might see kind of two bills going forward here, that surface bill and that comprehensive infrastructure package. Another thing that I want to make sure um, it is important to note as they uh, as the House and Senate are developing legislation is that earlier this month we did see Congress start to bring back earmarks. Um, and that's something that has been kind of by the wayside for many years, but with earmarks coming back. I'll be in a much more transparent way. Um, and this is something that will maybe bring more members of Congress from both sides of the aisle behind legislation as they'll be able to really show their constituents back home um, what this infrastructure package is doing for them and how it's going to be benefiting the projects in their states. Um, so that's one thing that can maybe kind of change the state of play here a little bit and can help this become a bipartisan package. Next slide, please, Anna. The biggest question, of course, is how we're going to pay for an infrastructure bill. Um, and that question remains unanswered and Congress is still trying to figure that out. We have heard from Speaker Pelosi that a portion of any infrastructure bill will in fact be paid for. They are not looking at strict deficit spending as when we look to an infrastructure package, but what that pay for will be still remains very unclear. Uh, as ASCE, we have historically supported an increase for the gas tax as well as piloting a shift to a vehicle miles traveled model, as well as a tax on electric vehicles as we're going forward. However, any decision on how to actually pay for an infrastructure bill is ultimately going to be left up to Congress. And while we are sharing what we support, we do believe that all options on the table approach must be under consideration in order to get something done, since this is, again, a unique time where we can maybe get a historical piece of legislation that's going to really impact some real change on our, our infrastructure. Um, one thing we have heard from the administration and we have heard from House Democrats has been um, uh, a discussion on raising taxes and some of the some of the highest earning Americans as a pay for. Um, that is, again, something that's under discussion and ASE remains agnostic on what that pay for should be, whether it be a tax increase or uh, something a bit more traditional that keeps the user fee model approach. And then uh, one last slide, please, Anna. Uh, I wanted to, before I wrap up, also focus a little bit on some of the energy and environment legislation that's moving forward. I had mentioned earlier that we might see two tracks here with that surface transportation reauthorization being, uh, being considered as standalone and then a budget reconciliation bill potentially being um, brought up as well. And it's gonna be that budget reconciliation bill if in fact they do go with budget reconciliation where you're going to see um, where you're going to see more of your green infrastructure included in there, maybe some more of your water spending in there, your broadband spending, um, uh, any language that might address the uh, the grid, et cetera, would be probably in that budget reconciliation package. So we've already started to see from the president a series of executive orders um, that are kind of his initial vehicle to start to implement some of these more climate focused policies. And I think we can expect more of that and see that ramped up in some sort of infrastructure package as we're going forward. And then just one other thing that I wanna make sure um, I address, and this goes back to that, that slide I mentioned earlier on HR2, kind of where Congress is with some of this legislation and some of these numbers that you might see thrown out of there. Um, HR2 would have invested about $70 billion into the grid network, um, not just to kind of build it more resiliently, but also to help transition to renewable energy. Um, so that, that is one thing to be on the lookout for. HR2 also would have included additional development into electric our electrical vehicle charging network, which is something that we've already seen in the Clean Future Act, for example, as well as additional funding for weatherization and smart communities infrastructure. And then HR2, and again, this then goes to the LIFT Act, which I mentioned before. Um, that's where we're seeing our investments for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. HR2 included $25 billion to the Drinking Water SRF. Um, and it also included an additional $40 billion for new wastewater infrastructure, as well as uh, funding and grants to encourage efficiency in the water sector and affordability programs and to address some of our stormwater needs. So um, we do hope we see some similar investments like we saw in HR2 in order to really boost spending in a lot of these infrastructure sectors. Um, but time really, time will really tell. The next few weeks, the next few months are going to be imperative. 
um, to really be reaching out, talking with legislators, urging for Congress to get something done. And that is, um, that's gonna be our primary focus. And as we have an infrastructure package out there, we hope it's bipartisan um, and it's something that can be implemented before the summer is actually out. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. How can we help you? <laughs> I will say, I think at this point, we need members of Congress to really hear about the importance of getting this done. Um, there's already, there was a, a committee, there was a committee hearing in the House Ways and, there was a member day hearing in the House Ways and Means Committee earlier today, where the Republicans ended up protesting the hearing because they didn't think it was going to be leading to a bipartisan infrastructure package. That's not where we need to be starting right now. We need all sides to come together. And I think members of Congress from both sides of the aisle need to hear you know, that infrastructure has historically been bipartisan and should continue to be bipartisan as we're going forward. We're happy to work with them on things like pay fors Members of Congress know where ASCE stands on pay fors It's really gonna be up to them to make some of these hard decisions um, as we're going forward. And it's really gonna be up to the federal government to show some of this leadership. As Anna mentioned earlier, a lot of states and a lot of local governments have really been um, bearing the brunt of this, they've been raising their gas taxes, but that's just hasn't been enough to really make the improvements we need. It's just been enough to kind of help us tread water um, to keep us in those Ds. Um, so we need the federal government to come in now and really show that leadership. And we think this package is going to be a great opportunity to do that. It can really set the stage for us the next couple of decades to improve our infrastructure. So we hope that members from both sides of the aisle can um, get behind um, working together so we have the best package possible. So oh, the Asset Leadership Network is not a large organization, but we have some very high level members. Are there specific uh, congressmen or senators that we can reach out to? Uh, maybe this is something that we continue offline, but we used to be able to go in person after the end of our annual event, and we'd have you know a Capitol Hill Day. And we were able to say, we have a solution. We're not coming to you with a problem similar to what you do. And they liked to hear that. So we still have that solution. How can we line up behind you to provide high impact? If you need a bunch of calls or something to a certain senator or a committee, if that's something that we strategize later, fine. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I would just, I'll just say that we have found since since the pandemic hit and all meetings have gone virtual that a lot of staff and a lot of members of Congress are actually more accessible than ever before. Um, as a lot of the other distractions when they're in the office are not necessarily there. Um, so we had our virtual fly in in conjunction with the report card release earlier earlier this month and our members actually found that more than ever, they met with their senator, they met with their actual member of Congress versus just staff, um, because, and they just seem to be a bit more accessible. So I definitely encourage um, the network to continue to do that outreach, um, to continue to hold those meetings. Um, at this point, we are really focused in on um, trying to get that message across with the committees of jurisdiction, with leadership of the committees of jurisdiction, um, his relationships, for example, with Sam Graves' office, he's the ranking member of the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee. I think it's important to start to work with their office. I know um, staff, staff in the minority on TNI are really open to hearing about different solutions and ways to pay for some of this. Um, they are really, um, really making concerted effort in TNI minority to make this a bipartisan bill. So any anything that you can do to help them with that um, and help support with that, I think would be great. Yeah, we do have uh, some uh, connection to DeFazio, um, but we'll, we'll go after the whole committee. Yeah. Yeah, and I and DeFazio, DeFazio is he is you know he's excited. He's moving forward. His staff is is deep in the throes, I think, of developing legislation. Um, but it doesn't hurt for them to also hear that you know we think the the best package that we can put out there will be a bipartisan package uh, to make sure everyone's working with the other side of the aisle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, we have learned that the banking committee actually has- uh, Transit. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, the uh, Federal Transportation uh, Administration, the uh, uh, MAP 21 has an asset management section in it. And we are heralding that as a good start 
but it needs to be more. They required asset management plans. We are hoping that more is required for all, you know, use ISO 55,000, you know, just that phrase. But anyway, that's for David Totman to uh, uh, address. So David, um, uh, you're on uh, mute and before you do that. Uh, today, we uh, published David's uh, report on a uh, TNI uh, water uh, hearing, uh, no, town hall, virtual town hall last week. And maybe you can summarize that. And, and, but later on, what David's into is very interesting in, in that he is representing the American Society of Civil Engineers to the ISO committee. And uh, he's been very nice in reaching out and interacting with us and with you too, David. Anything we can do to support your efforts, uh, please let us know. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Michael. Um, you know, in, in talking about ISO 55000 and ASCE, um, I, I kind of almost want to do a, a, a real quick, you know, history lesson. I was, I was just, you know, enamored with uh, Anna's presentation on how easily the words asset management just flowed. And, and it was used quite a bit. And, and, and Caroline even you know, used the term asset management and, and standards and uh, you know, an asset management plan. And, and I would dare say, you know, if we had this panel session you know, four years ago, the 2017 or the 2013, you know, eight years ago, you probably wouldn't have been hearing the term asset management as much. Um, you know, in the 2017 report card, we definitely had um, you know, the, the whole concept of full life cycle management of infrastructure. And we had, you know, resiliency and sustainability, and we had performance-based metrics. We had all those words in 2017, um, but the words asset management really didn't, you know, kind of come out. And, and now we're even into the point of, you know, ASCE, um, you know, is, um, you know, has kind of joined forces, if you will, with, with ISO 55,000, right, which is kind of the, you know, iconic title of asset management, you know, from a global perspective. And so you've seen this evolution from, you know, ASCE and, and as an organization, ASCE, we've always been about education, we've always been about standards and and for public infrastructure right and so that's been part of our lives for decades and but you're, you're starting to see this evolution from you know full life cycle management to asset management to now we're starting to even you know get into iso 55000 so I, you know, I think you'll start to see that vernacular you know coming more and more and and as you know caroline mentioned the, the ASC priorities letter i was i was privileged you know, enough to, you know, help craft some of the language. And we actually even got the word, you know, asset management plan um, into the priorities letter for as a, as literally a, a, you know, a requirement of federal funding, right? We've always said banks need collateral and, and AMP is, you know, a, a form of collateral that says you're going to spend the money wisely. So there's been this evolution, right, in ASCE in the vernacular and, and approaching asset management. And we've had asset management committees for a long time, um, but we actually now have, you know, a full on division in, in my, my, my institute, the Utility Engineering Surveying Institute. Um, uh, Celine Heyer, is, who was involved with the report card, she's the current chair of that division, right? So it's, it's grown in importance, I think, in, in our, everything that we do. And, and you know, kind of a comment back to Jim's question about Texas and the energy grid, you know, along with the report card in 2017, we also had, you know, the, the grand challenge and, and there's also a, a set of um, what they call failure to act reports that really talked about the compounding effect of different industries, right? And so while the report card shows, you know, specific industries, these failure to act reports were phenomenal in actually showing the compound effects of potential failure amongst the different, you know, energy and water sectors. And so again, you know, ASE has a, a strong history of educating about infrastructure. And now we're just, you know, really starting to use, use that language. And from a standards perspective, um, again, ASE has been all about standards. 
And in our priorities letter to, to the Biden infrastructure team, we mentioned the use of various, you know, ASCE standards, um, ASC, you know, seven on with respect to buildings and, and 24 on flood and, and 41 with seismic loading. These sort of standards, you know, can be applied to infrastructure. And I'm even looking at, you know, getting ISO, at least within the US, we can start to adopt some of these ASCE standards as, as annexes you know, to the ISO standard, right? And, and, and while it's the American Society of Civil Engineers, much of our work is global and other countries adopt, you know, ASCE standards for infrastructure. And so I, I definitely see a relationship between the ISO standard and the, you know, ASCE standards being used um, to, to help uh, definitely, you know, support one another. So, you know, I, I think it's just a natural extension. Uh, it's a, ex exciting times to be in ASCE and in asset management. And of course, with the new administration, uh, uh, lots of opportunities, as Caroline mentioned, about you know um, uh, hope of getting some of these 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 bills off and running, and and really taking a serious look at the the funding requirements, right? So, um, as as you've said, Michael, you know the ALN has has solutions um, and not more problems. And, and I, drew, I truly believe having been an asset management practitioner at a utility, um, I, I, I believe it is indeed the solution, right? Um, and, and some of the things that that's, uh, we'll, we'll be adding some additional language um, to these meetings that, that Caroline was talking about, you know, one of our canons in, in ASCE of, with civil engineering is, you know, um, we build public infrastructure to protect the, you know, health, safety, welfare of, of our citizens. And so there's a strong correlation between public infrastructure and public health. Uh, and, and I think with ISO 55,000 and the framework that allows leaders, you know, to kind of have this, this structured framework, um, it, it's going to help you know, utilities gain that public trust, right? So from public infrastructure to public health to public trust, it, it, it's, a, it's a framework of making good sound business decisions. And that's what really Congress is asking us to do, you know, with any funding that they're gonna be providing that we, we make good use of it. So it's, um, I, it, it all comes together. Uh, I think this relationship with ASCE and, and the ALN and ISO um, it really is about this public infrastructure and doing what's best for you know our citizens. And so, um, what did you, you know, learn? What did yep. you learn from uh, the event last uh, week? So, with the town hall, you know what was what was quite amazing um, was the town hall, uh, and and Chair DeFazio spoke, um, and we had um, uh, representation from the Children's Environmental Health Network and. Um, uh, you, you know, and uh, um, one of the uh, the federal leagues there of talking about funding that that what was a, a kind of an eye opening moment for me too was definitely bringing home the public health issue and 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 what was mentioned with you know Anna and Caroline about you know the issues of Flint, Michigan brought to bear a lot of attention about clean water and and the Children's Health Network even added you know. Kind of doubled down on that. That during COVID, you know, while schools have been improving the grade and addressing clean water in their schools, addressing you know, getting rid of lead service lines, a lot of the disadvantaged communities are still stuck, right? They still have lead service lines, and then during COVID, you know, our children are at home, and and you know, they're in their development years as toddlers, and so there's a big concern of you know, what are we doing? So we have to really address. In, in a serious nature, you know, the, the, the lead service lines. And, and I think, you know, Senator, um, well, Chair DeFazio kind of mentioned that some of this funding, infrastructure funding is specifically gonna be targeted towards, you know, uh, disadvantaged communities just because it's, it, it's been a, a challenge for a great uh, long time. And so, you know, that was one of the kind of the eye-opening moments to me and, and gave me passion to, you know, get out there and, and do these things because um, it, it's not that we don't have solutions. It's just, we just haven't, I think, had that attention and, and the, the, you know, the, the funding, because we, we always have more need than funding. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a set of priorities, which I think, you know, as Carolyn has 
kind of mentioned with the priorities, the ASC priorities letter, you know, um, we're, we're, we have some strong opinions on where those priorities should be, you know, should be placed. And so it's- And since, um, I, uh, since I helped to uh, edit your report- Yeah. Well, that one of the things that you said was that uh, Chair DeFazio requested input. Yes. And, and it, comments. It, so I know you're planning on doing something. I suspect, you know, the ASCE has, you know, overall thing, but we'd like to help either your message or the ASCE message. One of our board members and senior fellows, Jack Kelly, has a detailed question that uh, I'm going to save a bit, but he himself could write <laughs> something. He's a, a prolific writer. Um, but before we get to that, I want to ask a question uh, from uh, Jesse Rothkopf about the role of digital twin modeling to establish a way to help quantify and qualify needed investment. I've always said that the digital twin is a beneficial tool because it helps you to be able to say, people to say, I see what you're talking about relative to very complex issues. So do you think that there's any uh, role for the digital twin to help with the uh, uh, basically advocacy efforts or legislative efforts? Uh, very, very much so. And, you know, so you got to love our acronyms in our industry and our, in our titles, you know, and so digital twin is kind of the hot uh, buzzword in, in the tech space of, you know, it, and, and just like, again, you know, ASC has been talking about asset management for decades. They just didn't use that term. Um, we've all been doing digital twins for a very long time, and we just didn't use that term, so to speak. And so any of these models, um, for me, the big differentiator in digital twins is, you know, I have this, this you know, very structured uh, digital representation of our real world and infrastructure, but it's a multi-dimensional model, right? So I'm able to not only say, oh, gee, you know, it's it's cast iron is going to rust in a corrosive soil. It, it's probably going to break. I can actually then start to say, well, it's in the north part of town. It's in this neighborhood. Um, there's no funding for this particular district. You know, what would that look like? I can add in economic layers. I can add in social layers. I can add in classic triple bottom line type stuff that, to also then model as I'm formulating solutions. And so the answer is yes. Um, a little bit easier said than done, but that's the beauty of, of digital twins is that multi-dimensionality. I can, I can model lots of different inputs. For me, you know, we, as engineers, we build models that are very prescriptive and, and kind of behave within a certain constraint, right? Because we love our putting our boundary conditions and digital twins almost allow you to remove those boundary conditions. And, and think up the crazy stuff, right? And that's what we need in this, you know, in this day and age of understanding resilience and sustainability. Um, you know, who thought there would have been this massive snowstorm to blanket all of Texas, you know, that would have shut off all the power and therefore we couldn't start pumping water and we had boil notices, right? So- Well, the Texans who were there in 2011 would have believed it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, so so it's it's you know it, it's that visualization, it's the education to the masses that if you can see it, we can bet we're very visual humans, yeah. and we we can you know better yeah. put, wrap our minds around solutions if we can see them. And I think it it would be good to free the digital twin from engineering and use it for education and legislative. And I've got an education question and there's a couple other questions. Uh, Caroline, I know you have a hard end here. So thank you very much for joining us. But Anna and David, do you have uh, time to stick around for a couple more questions? Sure, I can. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And, and my husband and I switched roles today. So I don't have to worry about the daycare pickup. Oh, thank you for, uh, for doing that. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our, our patrons and our organizational members uh, who make these activities possible. Especially thank you to the Andrew James Advisory Group. Um, they provide training that leads to the ISO 55000 or the A55A professional certification, which 
teaches people how to be able to use the asset management structure of ISO 55000. So you might want to check that out. And um, this will be available in video and as a podcast. And next week, we're going to have round robin with our ALN senior fellows who have been watching this presentation and the GAO uh, high risk presentation to comment about what they think will be a path to success. So please join us again next week. But now I'm going to stop that. Uh, and people who have to go on, uh, thank you. Uh, we want to respect your time. But uh, people want more from this group. So uh, let me go to uh, Jim Dieter's question. Um, why am not able to find it? Um, but now let's go to Jack Kelly's first. Um, how can we make legislators aware that there are other elements of asset management that are important also uh, beyond the, you know, improving infrastructure and having plans? But the ISO 55000 structure has uh, things that are called out in the report card measurement, performance, all of these things totally uh, reinforce and reflect what you want. Uh, Caroline, how do you get deeper into subjects? It's so hard to even get their attention for the big picture. Um, you know, we have found um, that certain groups like the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis right now, they're actually getting very deep in the weeds when they're looking at how to address some of these issues. So I think it's really about making sure you're finding the right audience, the groups that are really focused on this. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have certain recommendations like that, uh, related to asset management, you know, putting them in, putting them in a one pager, putting them in a letter and starting to um, have some meetings with the relevant parties on Capitol Hill um, and sharing that information. But the time to really do that is now as they're working to develop an infrastructure package in the surface transportation bill. Okay, that came from Jack Kelly. And uh, Jack, I will help you get it into a one pager. Uh, Jack was with the uh, OMB for 36 years, and uh, he is prolific in his writing. Um, but I, I like the advice about the, the one pager, so thank Something you. Something easily digestible for Hill staff. The, and, yeah. and if they're interested, they can read more. And, and uh, you were setting up all kinds of uh, virtual meetings. Is that how you had the success? Uh, yep. We've, Hill staff is still having virtual meetings. Um, they've never, They've never really stopped at all. So, and as I said, they're easy to get through to in the same way you would be scheduling those in-person meetings. Um, so it, it, we, have, we haven't seen any lag in being, uh, having access. And you've all been mentioning education. Uh, Anna, we are in contact with other countries that provide, that are further advanced than the U.S. in terms of using ISO 55000 and asset management principles to help improve their infrastructures. We're trying to work with Australia and Canada and other places. Do you have that kind of outreach? And is there any benefit if we were to help you make some of these connections? We are strictly domestic, federal, uh, and state government relations. So I would say, I mean, I think to the extent that if you are looking to influence Washington and, and congressional leaders here, I think using other uh, countries as examples and case studies. Um, this really goes back to even the digital twin answer. You can you can better understand when you can see it. Um, so using uh -huh. other countries as examples of, of places that are doing this right. I think not only is a easily digestible concept for elected officials, but also, um, you know, you can, they, they can they can get a little competitive. So it's nice to point out where we aren't uh, we aren't number one. I, I know an architect who was involved in uh, the uh, DC metro system, and they wanted to have these really long escalators, and people were saying, "No, we can't do that." But when they said the Russians had one that was longer than this, they were like, what? If the Russians can do it, then we can do it too. So I think that's what you're talking about. Um, and uh, uh, Jesse Rothkoff, who asked about digital uh, twins, is talking about uh, the awareness of uh, resilience. And that was something, Anna, that you had as a topic. Is there anything further that you can uh, 
help us in terms of how to present the concept of resilience? Or what are you doing to present that? Um, yeah, I mean, I might kick it over to Caroline to answer that and David as well. I know you're involved in this area. Okay. Um, yeah, as, as I had said uh, earlier, as we are having meetings with Cap on Capitol Hill, resilience is the hot topic. Um, we truly are looking at legislation to build back better, make sure we're building stronger, and we are seeing committees start to look at how that can be done. Um, ranging from House Select Committee on the Clim uh, Climate Crisis, which I mentioned earlier, they are really looking at standards right now and what standards could be implemented and how they can maybe incentivize state and locals to utilize certain standards and making sure that we are building resilient infrastructure. Um, I know that building resiliently and climate principles will be um, probably a central tenant of any infrastructure package that's going to be um, that's going to be put out, um, with as, as many, I've heard numbers as much as, you know, $40 billion to be going really just specifically focused on how to uh, make sure you're building more resiliently in the face of um, climate change. So um, at any, anything that you would have out there that can really help push that message to provide solutions for how to, how to build more resiliently uh, would be welcome on Capitol Hill right now. And so, since we've been in this meeting, I actually uh, saw an email that the president's actually anticipated to release his budget proposal next week. Um, so we'll start to actually see some of the details about what the administration wants in terms of climate and infrastructure and what he's going to be asking Congress for. So um, things are moving very rapidly. So, you know, any, you know, codes, standards, solutions for how to build more resiliently, this is, infra uh, this is information I would definitely start sharing with Capitol Hill as soon as you can. You know, and to, to extend on that, I think, you know, ASCE, um, there's, there's many different, infra, you know, uh, associations that work with infrastructure, American Society of Civil Engineers, American Water Works Association, the American Public Works Association, and, and ASCE itself has an infrastructure resiliency division that, that, that does a lot of work with public works and, and ASCE. And, and even mentioned in our priorities letter was, you know, uh, kind of a, a, a guideline recommendation of using our manual of practice um, 140, which is about uh, resiliency. And so there's language from there that can, can be used in, in some of these types of, you know, solutions uh, of, of defining resiliency. So that's, that's kind of one of the first things, again, like asset management. What is asset management? Well, everyone says, well, what is resiliency mean, right? And so you know, you, you start to provide some definitions that people can uh, uh, relate to, but it, it is been, it's been a grassroots movement for quite some time with these other trade organizations as well. And then uh, Jim Dieter had asked uh, what individuals can do. So maybe if we can sum up with um, bullet points for our legislators, if we're gonna individually send a letter, a one page letter to our legislators and ask and request a, a virtual meeting. And I, I think, you know, like with the ASCE, if the ALN helps our members do that and we're representing a group as opposed to just an individual. But I think it's the way we've been doing it is we have the individual who are, is in that state and in that district send the letter, but we're there to back them up. What should be some, you know, each of you, what do you think are top bullet points to have in a one page or to our legislators? Um, it, it partially would depend on your organization's um, main principles as you're going forward, but I would, I would absolutely recommend um, just, I would keep it pretty high level with some of the principles, just making sure you're pushing them for an infrastructure package that's bipartisan. Um, and that is getting done, I would push for a timeline, say this summer, um, and then I would push that they include asset management principles. And if you wanted to kind of bullet out what some of those principles might be, um, I, I would include that in there as well. And then um, would probably just try to tie, tie it all together um, with, um, you know, a little bit of inf more information about some of the priorities for the network as you're going forward um, and just kind of talking through what the network is. I, I put all that in in okay. a letter. We're um, very similar to 
you know, we want what you want. You know? Yeah. And I, I will also say that if you, I, I believe it's on our report card website right now. Um, it's definitely on our ASC advocacy page. Um, we make it very simple to engage. You can go um, through our click and connect system and easily send a letter to your legislators um, sharing the report card, for example, um, and you can completely personalize those letters. So um, that, that is a, an easy resource for all of you that you can use on our advocacy page in order to contact your legislators. Yeah, Anna, I was gonna say, uh, is there anything specifically from the report card that you think makes a good summary? I think there are data points in the report card that emphasize the urgency of this. So the fact that the investment gap is growing, the fact that um, you know, our infrastructure GPA is stuck in the C's and D's, um, especially those 11 categories that are in the D's. So we want to not only recover from the COVID pandemic, but also set our economy and our population up for success in the future. Infrastructure is the clear and obvious way to do that. Well, you guys, you you all are so good. <laughs> it's just really a pleasure uh, uh, listening to you, David. What do you think uh, we should ask our legislators? Well, I, I think I think that's you know, as as you know, we're kind of working on some language right now um, that we will forward, you know. Um, for for ASE to kind of add into its points, you know, emphasizing some of the the uh, ISO fifty five thousand overlays that add on to the the words asset management and asset management plans. And I think, you know, um, our little work session. I think what what comes out very well, you know, that that works well in in Congress as well. That you know, the ISO fifty five thousand standard. Um, it, it's it's definitely you know it's a descriptive standards, not prescriptive. So that doesn't lock you into this one and only one way of doing it. So that flexibility, I think, would be quite attractive uh, for, for infrastructure organizations to adopt and, and you know, adapt to their, their particular needs. And, and the, the, the fundamental premise of pretty much all of asset management, but very much in the ISO 55,000 standard, you know, I think that, that bodes well for language to, to Congress, you know, that, that the asset management framework, you know, it's 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 outcomes oriented, right? And 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 those outcomes are aligned with the mission statement of the organization. And so that's a very you know good leadership sort of tool that you have this line of sight that says everything I am doing, this funding that you've given me, you know, I'm going to apply to our mission statement. And it's it's very it's outlined. So there is that line of sight. Um, so while it's not prescriptive, it's it, that framework is, you know, has intent, right? And and that's what I think everyone wants to know is, if I give you this money, what are you going to do with it? And and these these strategic asset management plans show that that line of sight. And and I think that's you know, we we can't do anything these days without you know mentioning the resiliency piece, right? Just because the norms every now and then I'm in water. You know, and I hear so many communities saying, well, we've had a hundred year flood three times now in the last five years, you know, and so it's, you know, the, the norms are gone. And, and when we were looking at capital planning, you know, I was looking at five, 10, 25, 50 years out for our capital plans at my, my utility. And now, my gosh, those plans are, are gone or shot, right? Because I, I, I'm, I'm doing really good if I can project, project, you know, three years out, five years out, and 10 years out is now like, oh my gosh, no one, you know, uh, what, what are we going to be like 10 years from now? So this resiliency, we're having to get into these adaptive plans, right? And that's why paper no longer works. We have to have these digital plans because we, we have to be able to respond to almost real-time information. Um, no, not almost. We we have to. Yeah. <laughs> well, that lang that language is in there in the priorities letter of of you know getting getting water at least the water industry out of you know and like like Defazio Chair Defazio said out of the 19th and 20th centuries and actually into the 21st century, you know get off of paper and, and get into these digital so get into innovative technology that help us you know move forward and part of his bill. Well, thank you all so much, uh, not just for being here, uh, but for the amount of work that goes into that report card and how studious you are 
in getting the information, making it accessible, breaking it down to what it costs each family. Uh, it's mind blowing amount of work. Uh, your, your organization is to be saluted and applauded and cheered. And uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedules to share this and inspire us to take some action and get out there and help with the legislative, legislative uh, advocacy. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Anna, Bye. Caroline. Bye. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to all the, the audience members, too. See you next week.